So today we're going to be talking about the Gospel of Judas. At the end of this little talk, I will read through what we have left of the Gospel of Judas. As always, if you would like a deeper discussion on these missing Gospels that we review on Wednesdays on this channel, then please follow the link in the description box below to go on over to David Zublik's platform called The Dark Outpost. On Tuesday nights, I go on his show and we have a very thorough discussion over these missing Gospels. As always on this show, I just do a quick review, a quick Cliff Notes version of what was discussed on David's show. As always, I would also like to thank all of our patrons. I am so appreciative of everybody who is on our Patreon program. If you would like to join the Patreon program, there is also a link down in the description box below. So as you guys know, I am a history lover. I love knowing the stories of people who walked this earth before us, figuring out how we got where we got. As most of you know, conspiracy is not a conspiracy. It has been around since the beginning of time throughout most governments and yes, throughout most religions. We know that we have a deep state, but we also have a deep church, as Archbishop Figano wrote about in his letters. Now, before every missing gospel, I like to go through a bit of a history of how the gospel was found, who they think wrote it, why perhaps it was viewed as heretical all those hundreds of years ago, over a thousand years ago, actually. But usually the most important information in each gospel lies in the gospel themselves. However, with the gospel of Judas, what I have discovered is that the history of the gospel, in my opinion, might be more important than what's written in the gospel. Since this gospel was found and examined, there have been three different theories that historians and scholars have come up with regarding this writing. One theory I happen to really like, but of course, as always, we will talk about all three. So in my notes, I labeled the Gospel of Judas a book for the red-pilled from the red-pilled of those who came before us. This is conversations between Jesus and Judas concerning the true predicament of the world of chaos that we live in as humans. So this text, this manuscript, was found in Egypt in the 1970s by a treasure hunter with a group of lost manuscripts that we know the early church fathers did speak about. It was sold to an antique dealer who tried to sell it on the black market for about three million dollars. Now, in my opinion, when we're talking about antiquity and we're talking about these manu missing manuscripts, sometimes I feel like the black market is the lesser of two evils because we know some of our federally funded institutions are maybe not the most honest and are, are pretty corrupt. I know we found that a lot with places like the Smithsonian. And so again, in some cases, these black market dealers are literally the lesser of two evils. Now, as this antiques dealer from Egypt found that he could not sell this missing gospel for three million, he eventually smuggled it into the United States in 1984. He put it in a safety deposit box in New Jersey where it sat for 16 years. And due to the climate of New Jersey, the documents started to crumble. One commentator said for 1600 years, it was just fine hidden in Egypt because of Egypt's dry weather, but 16 years in New Jersey led to a disaster. We already had some of the text missing and now because of this, even more fell apart. Well, in the early 2000s, another antique dealer named Chakos bought the manuscript and from then on it became known as the Codex Chakos. Again, there were other manuscripts in this codex that we will cover in a future episode, but today, obviously, we are focused on Judas's gospel. 
Now, the first English copy was released in 2006. So yes, this is a very new lost gospel. Now, with the manuscript, the findings, they, they knew that this manuscript would be a Gnostic gospel. And once again, we'll review Gnosticism a little bit later on. This manuscript was written in Coptic, and Coptic is how a lot of these lost manuscripts have been written. It was an ancient Egyptian language with some Greek infused. The original text was most likely written between 130 and 170 AD at the latest, and at the earliest, it was written 60 years post the death of Jesus. The manuscript is now in a thousand pieces, and they had to use Coptic paleographers to put what was left of the manuscript back together before scholars and historians could examine it. There are 16 chapters regarding the teachings of Jesus. The focus of this gospel is cosmology and spiritual matters. So we're going to get some a little bit into the Sethian theology, which we'll get into even deeper next week with the book we're going to be covering next week, which we'll go over a little bit of it here today. Now we know from the gospel that Judas was the only one who truly knew of Jesus because he possibly was sent to earth to stop Jesus. Now this gets into the first two theories when looking at the Gospel of Judas. The first one, there were some mistranslations. And they believed that the Gospel was saying that Judas was one of Jesus' closest disciples and therefore he had the responsibility of turning Jesus into Pontius Pilate so Jesus' purpose on earth could be fulfilled. With that angle, Judas comes across as a bit of a hero and was perhaps given the title of villain too quickly. Now, for a long time, they sat with this translation, but then another Coptic paleographer came along and said, no, you've mistranslated some of these words. It's not saying that Judas was the closest of the disciples to Jesus, but that he was actually a demon who was sent to earth to stop Jesus from doing what Jesus was sent here to do. And from this angle, we see Jesus as the Christ and Judas as possibly the Antichrist, these opposing forces. Now, again, as we get into this theory, I'm going to remind everybody, as I did with the raw material, that it is said that it is a sign of an intelligent mind when you can entertain an idea without accepting it. And so as you go through all this stuff with Judas and into the Sethian theology that existed in the early Christian period, I am aware that this might trigger some people. And I'm asking you kindly if this does trigger you to understand that we're not telling you to accept this. I am definitely not telling you to accept this. I'm just finding this very interesting. This gives us a little bit of information into the mythology of the creation story as it existed 2,000 years ago, something that we have lost within our own church. Part of me feels like we've lost this intentionally. And as we look deeper into the Sethian theology, again, as we will last week, we see some connections to other faiths as well. Now, if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, and this stuff does trigger you, I would kindly ask that you not leave any abusive comments because Jesus wouldn't do that. And again, we're not saying by covering this, this doctrine or this gospel that this is absolutely the truth. We're just looking at it. On Esoteric Atlanta, we don't want anything censored. We want people to make up their own minds because that is the free will that was given to us by God as this gospel will tell us. Also, two things that are different about this gospel, which will lead us into the third theory, which I will get to in a little bit, was that this gospel was not written by Judas, does not claim to be written by Judas, nor does it claim to be written by a student of Judas. We also know that this gospel was not written by a witness to Jesus. So please keep that in mind as we move further along in this study. 
So just to review, Gnostic versus Orthodox of the early Christians. So we talked about this in an earlier episode that Gnosis means inner knowledge. Now we do need to point out that these people, these early Christian groups, these different schools of theology, were not calling themselves Gnostics. If you remember from last week, we learned that the early Christians did not know what to do when Jesus was executed. And believe it or not, for the early Christians, including the Gnostics, the belief was his execution was secondary to his teachings. His life was more important than his death. The Gnostics or early Christians believed that Jesus was sent to free man, not by his death, but by the teachings of his life. His resurrection was just the finale to prove that his teachings were worthy. So there's a great quote by a professor at Chapel Hill who focuses on old religion, especially the early Christian faith. And he says, Gnostics knew who they were how they got here, and how they can return back home. The Gnostics believe our souls were not from this world, and our job in this world was to know God within ourselves in order to go back home. We see this, Jesus says this in the, in the canonized Bible, as well as all the um, deemed tyrannical by Gospels as well, that know thyself, the kingdom of heaven lies inside of you. This is all an, an internal relationship and practice with the divine. The Gnostics believe that Jesus was sent by God to teach us about ourselves and who we truly are and how to get back to God through inner knowledge of God. They believe Jesus came to earth to set men free from man's enslavement to the natural world, which was and is ruled by Lucifer since the fall. This resulted in Lucifer hijacking the world and convincing people that we were the only ones, therefore cutting us off from galaxies and spiritual existence. This means our physical bodies were created by the Elohim in order to use or to serve Lucifer as slaves. The true God stepped in and gave us a spark of spirit that is in what is made of the image of God, the true God, not our bodies in the chaos of this earth. So let me explain that again. The Gnostics believed that Lucifer, and we're going to get into this because it was, it's way more complicated than what we've, we've been taught, this, this battle between God and Lucifer. We know that Lucifer and Satan are two separate entities. And when Lucifer fell, he fell with a lot of other beings as well. And that he came to this planet and used the Elohim. The Elohim is mentioned in the um, Gospel of the Holy Twelve. We also see Elohim in the canonized Bible. The Elohim basically means many gods, gods with the lowercase g. A lot of uh, scholars believe this possibly means extraterrestrials, like the Draco, the Anunnaki, the lizard people. And that Lucifer, along with the Elohim, decided to create human beings in the Elohim's image. So in the image of these humanoid extraterrestrials to serve Lucifer, to be part of Lucifer's army against God. And then God stepped in and said, no, you don't. And he put spirit and consciousness inside of the natural body. And that spirit and that consciousness is what makes us God's children now. and means we no longer belong to Lucifer. And so this world, as the Gnostics or early Christians believed, this world was not ours. It's where our bodies were created, but because of the anointing of spirit, of consciousness, we were thus given free will, and we were given to God. Because a spirit never dies. A body does, but a spirit doesn't. This plays into a huge, huge part of the cosmology in the Gospel of Judas, and a cosmology is the study of the cosmos. So the Gnostics believed that the spiritual world was the bulk of the battle, and each had his own battleground to contend with, being our bodies, our inner world. So if you look at the spiritual bo body and the spiritual battle, we know that angels are spiritual. We know that we are spiritual. But sometimes we forget that demons are also spirits. And that's this battle that's happening all around us and inside of us. 
They believe that the true God would never be understood by men. And we've talked about this. This is the exact same in yoga, that we can't possibly understand the true God because the true God isn't mortal. They, but they believe that our inner knowing was the closest we could get to returning back to our home with him. That death wasn't an ending, but a beginning. That we, as spirits, would resurrect into our true God. So the Gnostics believed that a lot of religions, including aspects of Judaism, were corrupted to serve the god of darkness of this natural world, which is Lucifer. And we are seeing this to be true. We're seeing a lot of that happening in churches today. So it's interesting that this has been happening for 2,000 years. It's important for me to note that throughout the Gospel of Judas, you will see different vocabulary words to describe places and beings. This should not scare you. Please understand that this is very normal in all historical study and all subjects. As language evolved, words changed. However, many con concepts did not. It was Shakespeare who said, a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. A lot of people get very flustered when they see something that they believe to mean one thing but has a different name when it's really just the name that's changed. So the early church fathers hated the Gnostic sects. There were many of them. The early church fathers wanted to have the earthly power to decide what you would and would not believe. And they believed that they were better than the people and had been given this divine right to control the masses from God. Although in my mind, I wonder which God. Sounds a lot like our fact checkers today. The early church fathers supported censorship and wanted complete control over the people. The Gnostics, on the other hand, believed that your beliefs were between you and God alone as Jesus taught. The early church fathers wanted a structure of service and ritual to organize structure of the church and its obedience from its people. The Gnostics did not. The early church fathers hated the Gnostics because when one takes control of one's own relationship with God, then they have no power over the people. This brings us to a man named Irenaeus. Now I've run into Irenaeus a lot in my study of these lost gospels. Every time I see his name, I do a little eye roll because he seems to be lacking in a lot of understanding. And I'm saying this from 1800 years into the future. Obviously I never knew this man. And most of the time, I don't even bring him up because it's not really important. His role in this stuff isn't really important with the other Gospels because, again, as I said in the beginning, with the other Gospels, the bulk of what the Gospels say is the most important part, whereas with the Gospel of Judas, the history, in my opinion, really is the most important part. Well, Irenaeus lived from around 130 AD to 202 AD. He lived about 150 years post-Jesus he is considered to be an early church father. He is a saint by the Catholic Church standards, although that's not saying much because of what we know about the Catholic Church now. He was a student of Polycarp, who we spoke about last week, and possibly John. He was a Greek bishop who believed he had authority from God to rule the faith. He hated the Gnostics. So he was one of these early church fathers that did not want people to have their own relationship with God. He wanted to control the faith and he wanted to control people, keep them vulnerable. He had what he called three pillars of orthodoxy. This was approved scripture, so he believed in censorship, tradition and ritual, and the foundation of the apostles' successors. So he felt like that the only people who could be making decisions on this new faith were people who had been students, direct students of the apostles. Now in teaching the faith, I can understand where this would be important. However, when it comes to having the faith, it's not important at all. Jesus needed his disciples to spread the word. He didn't need his disciples or the students of his disciples to then control the faith. He needed to, them to give the faith, 
to tell people like you, you alone have the relationship with God. That relationship with God is between you and nobody else. The Gnostics understood this. They understood the difference between spirit and nature. And perhaps people like Irenaeus did as well. Perhaps they just didn't want that. Maybe they, they just were obsessed with their own power. I don't know. I wasn't there. But from what I see of Irenaeus, I see a, a narcissist and I see a megalomaniac. But that's just my opinion. He was known as the heresy hunter. He wrote against the heresies. He created a five-volume smear campaign against these Gnostic sects, these people that believed in spiritual practices. This was basically what we would call propaganda or fake news. If we want to look at Irenaeus and compare him to another important figure in the Bible or from, from earlier, from these times, would be Paul. Paul was a Gnostic. Irenaeus was an anti-Gnostic. Paul and Irenaeus follow two different beliefs. Paul never knew Jesus when Jesus was alive. He only had his experience with Jesus after Jesus died. This was something that Irenaeus was not happy with because Irenaeus wanted control because Irenaeus was a student of John. I hope that makes sense. So Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, was a Gnostic. We know, we've talked about Paul in prior episodes where the original church wanted to get rid of Paul's letters because he was a Gnostic, because he was pro-Gnosticism. He was pro this idea of have, you having your own relationship with God. And Irenaeus, well, he was an anti-Gnostic. He wanted to dictate your relationship with God, and he believed that there were only certain people who should be allowed to dictate your personal relationship with God. Now, Irenaeus hated the Gospel of Judas, and this is, he hated a lot of the Gospels. He came up with not liking any of these banned Gospels, but this is really important, his hatred of this Gospel for this Gospel particular. He claimed that the people who used the Gospel of Judas as a source text were the Cainites. Now, please refer back to spirituality being both dark and light. Remember, angels and demons are both spiritual. Canites could also be considered another Gnostic group of inner knowledge. However, their inner knowledge and their worship wasn't on the true God that Jesus spoke about, but the Luciferian God. These people are still around today. A good example of this spirituality being both dark and light is Trump is spiritual and his beliefs. And so is Hillary Clinton. She's also spiritual in her beliefs. These are two sides of the spiritual battle with in the inner knowing of who they decide to worship. So they're both worshiping different entities. And they both have knowledge of different entities that are in opposition with each other. Again, I want to remind everybody that the Gnostics did not call themselves Gnostics. This term Gnosticism was added in later by historians to describe these early Christian schools. The Cainites inverted everything, as they still do. Cain is the good guy, Abel is the bad guy, Lucifer is the good guy, God is the bad guy, etc. We know about these people. Well, Irenaeus, in his need to get rid of the Gospel of Judas, claimed that this was the Gospel that the Cainites used in their worship of Lucifer, which is absolutely not true. This was, again, propaganda or fake news. This was a smear campaign. And we'll get into why that is in a little bit. So many scholars do not believe at this point that the Cainites used the Gospel of Judas. Many scholars believe that Irenaeus started this fake news or propaganda campaign in order to stop people from reading the Gospel of Judas. If we're looking at our first two theories on the Gospel of Judas, this is either because he did not understand the Gospel, which is unlikely for the time, or because he was obsessed with controlling the masses and therefore didn't want the masses to understand cosmology. And then here comes the third theory that I tend to believe is probably the most accurate. Irenaeus knew that the Gospel of Judas was written as a political piece to expose the early church fathers 
and what was to come with them, and eventually Constantine. You see, many historians believe that the Gospel of Judas was written to warn people that the church leadership was turning into a more demonic entity than a divine one. Some of these sects, these Gnostic sects that really wanted to focus on spirituality and love and unity, saw people like Irenaeus corrupting the teaching. And with the Gospel of Judas, they were writing these pieces to warn people. In the Gospel of Judas, there is a scene which we will get to where the disciples see themselves practicing satanic practices. And Jesus says, and they tell Jesus about this vision, Jesus tells them, like, that's you. And so what this means is, like, their students, their descendants of this faith would end up corrupting the faith, would end up changing some practices in the Christian faith into satanic practices. And we know this is true. We have been talking about this, especially on the Dark Outpost, for a really long time. Constantine was kind of the nail in the coffin when it came to perverting some of what the early Christians celebrated and held dear. I mean, he outlawed Passover. He evolved the Saturnalian holiday of December and called it Jesus' birthday. The resurrection of Jesus was turned into Easter, which is Ishtar, which is a pagan Canaanite holiday of fertility. So it could be that Irenaeus knew that whoever wrote the Gospel of Judas was calling him out by creating this story of Judas being a demon that was here when Jesus was here to pull Jesus off course. Just as these so-called church fathers were allegedly doing as well. I find this super interesting, especially in 2021 when there's been so much happening in regards to whistleblowers and people exposing the church. Certain celebrity pastors that happen to be born into Luciferian families and are still a part of these families. So it's actually quite handy that this gospel popped up when it did to remind us that this battle has been going on for a long time. And sometimes what we are taught at the surface level isn't necessarily the truth. Now, as I said, that's the theory that I tend to gravitate towards the most. It was written by a red pillar from back then, someone who had been red-pilled and saw the church leaders, the so-called church leaders for exactly who they were, and was trying to warn people, just like many other people have done today in our society all over social media. So whoever wrote the Gospel of Judas has a lot in common with us. However, because there is so much missing from the Gospel of Judas, I'm not going to make a full-on opinion, even though I tend to lead more towards this being a red-pilled manuscript, I'm still going to leave the possibilities open for it being something completely different because, again, we're, we've met, we're missing a lot of it. So there's some ideas in Judas to explore, and we're going to talk about these before we go into the reading. And again, this is going to come up next week, too, as we look into Sethian theology as well. That was a theology that was alive and well in the early Christian faith. So again, as we spoke about, the earth was hijacked by the fallen angels, Lucifer. These fallen angels, or Elohim, created the natural state of man and animals to serve the fallen angels and to serve Lucifer as slaves. Then the true God came in and sparked consciousness into the spirit of man. By sparking consciousness, a soul into the spirit of man, the man then became in the image of the one true God within the spirit. And therefore, God now has us as his children because consciousness is eternal, spirit is eternal, whereas body is not. After that happened, Lucifer then cut his slaves off, what Lucifer sees as his slaves, us, man, from these heavenly creatures, even ETs, in order to harvest our divine spirit. They still do this today, 
and their harvesting ceremonies. And I think you guys know what I'm talking about. So after all this happened 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to teach people the inner knowledge to free their souls from the problems of the body and the natural world created by Lucifer. So in this timeline of man being alive, there were many thousands of years of this struggle. And then Jesus came and was like, listen, here's the deal. You are children of God through your spirit. In the, the Gospel of Thomas or Didymus, the twin, we talked about that idea of Jesus telling us that our spirit were like his spirit. They were, son, were sons and daughters of God, of the true God, not of Lucifer, of the true God. And Jesus had to come into a natural body that according to this philosophy was designed by Lucifer. The second point to know or idea to know before exploring Judas is that the disciples are misguided and sometimes do not totally understand what Jesus is teaching. So through the lineage of the disciples, there will be corruption as there had been in all religions. We just spoke about this. And again, Judas in this gospel is the only one that truly knows who Jesus is because Judas was sent here from the dark side to try to stop Jesus. Jesus was sent from the light. Judas was sent from the dark. Jesus was sent from the true God. Judas was sent from Lucifer to battle it out in the natural world, the Christ and the Antichrist. We also know that Judas, who is a banker, interesting, we've talked about that before with Judas, he was the banker. He was also a demon. Jesus calls him the 13th demon in this gospel. They talk about a place called Barbello, and in cosmology, again, cosmology is the study of the cosmos, this is the highest realm, okay? This is also referred to as the Father Mother, which we read about in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. This is where Jesus' spirit came from. This is also called the glory of the revelation. So there's many different realms of spirituality. If you think about like angels and archangels and all these different levels of entities, we kind of spoke about that with the raw material where there's all these de different densities of beings. Barbello is where Jesus came from, and it's a very high level of what we would call heaven nowadays. Now, Sophia, again in cosmology, is one of the lowest realms who fell from grace and helped in creating the natural world with Lucifer. And again, this comes from the Sethian text, which when we go into our next book next week, we will go a little bit deeper into this. Now, from my understanding of the history of when the Gospel of Judas was written, many early Christians would have been familiar with this cosmology. They would have understood the idea of different realms of spiritual beings. Something that we are not really given the opportunity to study in our churches today. And looking at this Sethian text and the Sethian philosophy, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying it's interesting. And one of the things that really stuck out to me was how complex this battle between good and evil really is. You know, we're given in our churches the very simplified version. However, there is way more complexity. I think those of us who are awake right now and really understand what's going on in the world are really starting to understand that this complexity. We know that Revelation has been translated completely wrong in the past. We're starting to retranslate it as a society now. And again, I find it very serendipitous that this gospel showed back up right at the right time to remind us that our relationship with God is only between us and God. All right, with that being said, we're going to go and look at the gospel of Judas some of you might have more questions now than answers. And again, I do suggest you joining us on the Dark Outposts if you want a more thorough conversation about these Gospels. And hopefully even more questions will be answered next week when we go into the Apocryphon of John. Before we begin our reading on the Gospel of Judas, just a reminder that we are still missing a lot of the Gospel of Judas. There are words that are missing. And as we know, one missing word can change the narration of a story. 
I will let you know when there are words missing, but if you're confused by some sentences, that is probably why. And so we begin what we have left of the Gospel of Judas, the introduction. This is the secret message of judgment. Jesus spoke with Judas Iscariot over a period of eight days, three days before he celebrated Passover. When he appeared on earth, he did signs and great wonders for the salvation of humanity. Some walked in the way of righteousness, but others walked in their transgressions. So the twelve disciples were called. He started to tell them about the mysteries beyond the world and what would happen at the end. Often he didn't reveal himself to his disciples, but you'd find him in their midst as a child. Jesus criticizes the disciples. One day he was with his disciples in Judea. He found them sitting together, practicing their piety. When he came up to his disciples, sitting together, praying over the bread, he laughed. The disciples said to him, Master, why are you laughing at our prayer? What have we done? This is what is right. I'm not laughing at you. You are not doing this because you want to, but because through this, your God will be praised. They said, Master, you, missing some words, are the Son of God. And Jesus said to them, How do you know me? Truly I say to you, no generation of the people among you will know me. When his disciples heard this, they started to get angry and furious and started to curse him in their hearts. But when Jesus noticed their lack of understanding, he said to them, Why are you letting your anger trouble you? Has your God within you and his stars become angry with your souls? If any of you is strong enough among humans to bring out the perfect humanity, stand up and face me. So we see here that Jesus is trying to tell the disciples about the manipulation of humanity and this cosmology that was understood in the early Christian faith. Again, we've spoken about this before, that the Elohim are lesser gods, whereas Almighty God is one God. The Bible does mention the Elohim, as well as the some of the missing gospels, although that, I believe, has been taken from us, that information, that our natural world, our natural bodies were created to be slaves to these fallen entities. And so God came along and anointed us with consciousness. And that is what is in the image of God is our consciousness, which thus gives us free will. And Jesus came to liberate us. And so a lot of these older religions and now the Christian religion have been manipulated in service to a darker God, according to this early theology within the early Christian sect. So Jesus is saying, who among you actually really understands this? And who can look me in the eyes and tell me they really understand what it is I'm telling you? Even in your prayers, in your ceremonies, you're, you're not praying to the God that I came from. And obviously the disciples don't totally get this, but we continue. All of them said were strong enough, but their spirits weren't brave enough to stand before him except Judas Iscariot. He was able to stand before him, but he couldn't look him in the eye, so he looked away. Judas said to him, I know who you are and where you've come from. You've come from the immortal realm of Barbello, and I'm not worthy to utter the name of the one who sent you. So again, Barbello is the upper realm, the highest realm of Almighty God, of the light. That's where a lot of these demons and fallen angels came from during the Great Fall. And uh, it's also a name, again, for the mother-father, which we saw in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Then Jesus, knowing that he was thinking about what's exalted, said to him, Come away from the others, and I will tell you the mysteries of the kingdom. Not so that you'll go there, but you'll grieve much, because someone else will replace you to complete the twelve before their God. So basically, at this point, we see Jesus calling Judas out. Again, Jesus is the Christ. And what makes us believe that there wasn't an Antichrist during Christ's time, too? 
Judah said to him, when will you tell me these things? And when will the great day of light dawn for the generation? And then again, we have some missing words. But when he said these things, Jesus left him. The next section is called Another Generation. The next morning he appeared to his disciples and they said to him, Master, where did you go? And what did you do when you left us? Jesus said to them, I went to another great and holy generation. His disciples said to him, Lord, what generation is better and holier than us? That's not in these realms. Now, when Jesus heard this, he laughed. He said to them, why are you wondering in your hearts about the strong and holy generation? Truly, I say to you, no one of this realm, and by this he could possibly mean timeline, like the age of Pisces timeline, will see that generation. No army of angels from the stars will rule over it. And no person of mortal birth will be able to join it. Because that generation doesn't come from, we're missing some words here, that has become, again, missing some words, the generation of the people among them is from the generation of the great people, again, missing some words, the powerful authorities who, missing some words, not the powers, missing some words, those by which you rule. So the beginning of this statement does mean, I feel like he is talking about the age of Pisces versus the age of Aquarius as the generations. Um, we've spoken about that in other missing gospels. And, um, but the last part of this, we, we're missing so much that we can't really be clear what exactly he is saying. However, when the disciples heard these things, they were troubled in their spirits and they couldn't say a thing. And I put a little note here in my notes saying we can empathize with them because we've all had quite a rude awakening these last few years as we've come to know that so much has been taken from us. And so many of the people that we've held in authority, especially our religious leaders, are not people that should be in authority. So we can totally empathize with the disciples there. The next section is called the Disciples' Vision, and this is, I believe, a super important section. Another day, Jesus came up to them, and they said to him, Master, we've seen you in a dream because we had great dreams last night. But Jesus said, Why, missing some words, hidden yourselves? And they said, We saw a great house, a house with a great altar in it, and twelve people. We'd say they were priests in a name. And a crowd of people was waiting at the altar until the priest finished receiving the offerings. We kept waiting too. Jesus said, what were they like? And they said, some fast for two weeks, others sacrifice their own children, others their wives, praising and humbling themselves among each other. Others sleep with men, others murder, yet others commit many sins and do criminal things. And the people standing before the altar invoked your name. In all their sacrificing, they filled the altar with their offerings. And when they said this, they fell silent because they were troubled. Jesus said to them, Why are you troubled? Truly I say to you, all the priests standing before that altar invoked my name. And again I say to you, my name has been written on this house of the generation of the stars by the human generations, and they have shamefully planted fruitless trees in my name. Jesus said to them, You are the ones receiving the offerings on the altar you've seen. That's the God you serve, and you're the twelve people you've seen, and the animals you brought in to be sacrificed as the crowd led you astray before that altar. Your minister will stand up and use my name like that, and the generation of the pious will be loyal to him. After him, another person will present those who sleep around, and another of those who murder children, and another of those who sleep with men, and those who fast, and the rest of impurity, crime, and error. And those who say, we are equal to the angels, they are the stars that finish everything. It has been said to the human generations, look, God has accepted your sacrifice from the hands of priests, that is, the minister of error, but the Lord who commands is a Lord over everything. On the last day, they will be found guilty. Jesus said to them, stop sacrificing animals. 
You've offered them over the altar, over your stars, with your angels, where they've already been complete. So let them become, missing some words, with you and let them become clear. His disciples said to him, cleanse us of our sins that we've committed through deceit of the angels. Jesus said to them, it is not possible, nor can a fountain quench the fire of the entire inhabitants of the world. Nor can a city's well satisfy all generations except the great stable one. A single lamp won't illuminate all the realms except the second generation, nor can a baker feed all creations under heaven. And when the disciples heard these things, they said to him, Master, help us and save us. Jesus said to them, Stop struggling against me. Each of you has his own star, and of the stars missing words, what belongs to it, missing words. I wasn't sent to the corruptible generation, but to a strong and incorruptible generation because no enemy has ruled over that generation, nor any of the stars. Truly, I say to you, the pillar of fire will fall quickly and that generation won't be moved by the stars. So we know that the Christian church is corruptible and we know that the disciples went out and they had their disciples who had their disciples and they had their disciples and so Jesus is saying like it's through your lines that they the people are going to end up using my teachings to to manipulate it to worship the wrong deity to worship Lucifer basically we see that with the practices of, of sacrifice that are in the book of Leviticus in the Bible, and, and we also know that this is common for the Canaanites. So Jesus is telling us that. And, and if we look at this writing as, as a tool to try to um, warn the people against the original founding fathers who were start, starting to move away from the actual teachings of Jesus, it's like they're telling us that this is what's going to happen. The Christian faith is not going to be the Christian faith that Jesus brought to us, but yet a manipulation of a Luciferian faith. Jesus is telling us this in the book of Judas, and the writer of Judas is trying to warn us of this. So obviously we can see why they did not want people reading this book. So the next section is called Jesus and Judas. And when Jesus said these things, he left, taking Judas Iscariot with him. He said to him, the water on the exalted mountain is from missing words. It didn't come to water, missing some words, the well of a tree, of the fruit, missing some words, of this realm, missing some words after a time, missing some words, but came to water God's paradise and the enduring fruit because it won't corrupt the generation's walk of life, but it will exist for all eternity. Judah said to him, tell me what kind of fruit does this generation have? Jesus said, the souls of every human generation will die. However, when these people have completed the time in the kingdom and the spirit leaves them, their bodies will die, but their souls will live and they will be taken up. So again, the bodies are going to die. The bodies that the Elohim created will not be forever, but the souls that God gave man, the spirit will be taken back to Barbello, back to what we call heaven. Judas said, what will the rest of the human generations do? Jesus said, it's not possible to sow on rock and harvest its fruits. In the same way, it's not possible to sow on the defiled race along with the perishable wisdom and the hand which created mortal humans so that their souls may go up to the rounds above. Truly, I say to you, no ruler, angel, or power will be able to see these places that this great holy generation will see. When Jesus said this, he left. Jesus said, Master, just have you listened to all of them. Now listen to me too, because I have seen a great vision. So again, remember, Jesus knows that Judas is not really a human, that he is an agent of of darkness, can't come to um, corrupt Jesus' disciples from the very beginning. He doesn't want the the, uh, agents of Lucifer, the agents of darkness, they don't want anybody freeing these quote-unquote enslaved people that they've created for their service. But Jesus laughed when he heard this and he said to them, why are you all worked up, you 13th demon? But speak up and I will bear with you. So he's just calling him out. He's the 13th demon. He's an angel of 
of the darkness. And we did speak about this again in the um, a future or a past episode when we talked about vampires, about the idea that Judas was a vampire. Um, there are other books about that. So if, if you go to the Dark Outposts, you'll find that um, episode we did where we dove into that as well. Judas said to him, in the vision I saw myself, the 12 disciples are stoning me and chasing me rapidly. And I also came to the place where I had followed you. I saw a house in this place and my eyes couldn't measure its size. Great people surrounded it and the house had a roof of greenery. In the middle of the house was a crowd. Master, take me in with these people. Jesus answered and said, your star has led you astray, Judas. And that no person of mortal birth is worthy to enter the house you've seen because the place is reserved for those who are holy. Neither the sun nor the moon will rule there nor the day, but those who are holy will always stand in the realm with the holy angels. Look, I've told you the mysteries of the kingdom and I've taught you about the errors of the stars and missing some words sent on high over the 12 realms. Judas said, Master, surely my seed doesn't dominate the rulers, does it? Jesus answered and said to him, Come, let me tell you about the holy generation. Not so that you'll go there, but you'll grieve much when you see the kingdom and all its generations. So Jesus is like, let me tell you about the people that are going to defeat your master. When Judas heard this, he said, What good has it done me that you've separated me from that generation? Jesus answered and said, you'll become the 13th and you will be cursed by other generations and will rule over them. In the last days, they'll missing some words to you and you won't give up to the holy generation. The next section is Jesus reveals everything to Judas. Jesus said, come and I'll teach you about the mysteries that no human will see because there exists a great and boundless realm whose horizons no angelic generation has seen and which is a great invisible spirit, which no angelic eye has ever seen, no heart has ever comprehended, and it's never been called by any name. And a luminous cloud appeared there, and he, the spirit, said, let an angel come into being to attend me. And the great angel, the self-begotten, the God of light, emerged from the cloud. And because of him, another four angels came into being from another cloud, and they attended the angelic self begotten and said, The self begotten let a realm come into being, and it came into being just as he said, and he created the first luminary to rule over it. He said, Let the angels come into being to serve it, and myriads without the number can come into being, and he came into being to serve it and myriads without a number. And he said, let a luminous realm come into being, and it came into being. And he created the second luminary to rule over it, along with the myriads of angels without number to offer service. And that's how he created the rest of the realms of light. And he made them to be ruled and created them for the myriads of angels without a number to assist them. And Adam's was the first cloud of light that no angel could ever see among those called God. And Adams begat Seth in, and the place after he, the image of, missing some words and the likeness of this angel, he made the incorruptible generation of Seth appear to the twelve luminaries, and then he made seventy-two luminaries appear in the incorruptible generation according to the Spirit's will, and the seventy-two luminaries themselves made three hundred sixty luminaries appear in the incorruptible generation according to the Spirit's will, so that there be five of each. And the twelve realms of the twelve luminaries made up their father with six heavens for each realm, so that there was seventy-two heavens for seventy-two luminaries for each one of the five firements for a total of three hundred sixty firements. They were given authority and great army of angels without a number of for honor and service, along with the virgin spirits, too, for the honor of service for the realms and the heavens of their firements. Now, if some of this stuff, this cosmology that Jesus is talking to Judas about sounds confusing, don't worry, you're not alone. Again, there was a lot about the early Christian uh, mythology, creation story that has been taken from us that we don't know about. And so some of this stuff might be a little bit confusing. Now, this is called Sethian 
theology at this point in our timeline for us people, for the historians that look at this stuff. And we'll get more into the Sethian theology as we go through more of these heretical band of books. So just keep listening and over time, hopefully it will make more and more sense. Now the crowds of those immortals is called cosmos that is perishable by the fathers and the 72 luminaries with a self begotten and his 72 realms. That's where the first human appeared with his incorruptible power in the realm that appeared with his generation in the cloud of knowledge and the angel who is called missing words. After, after these things, missing words said, let 12 angels come into being to rule over chaos and Hades and look from the cloud. There appeared an angel whose face flashed with fire and whose likeness was defiled by blood. His name was Nembro, which means rebel. Another angel, Saklas, who came from the cloud too. So Nimbros created six angels and Saklas did two to be assistants. They brought out 12 angels in the heavens, which each of them receiving a portion in the heavens. So again, these are the rulers that created our world to serve them, to serve the dark forces. And then the almighty God was like, not so fast. I'm going to anoint these people these beings you've created with consciousness so I can take care of them and they can be my children. And the 12 rulers spoke with the 12 angels, let each of you missing words and let them missing words, generations, missing words, five angels. The first who is called the good one, the second, the eye of fire, the third is Galilea, the fourth is Yobel, and the fifth is Adonius. These are the five who ruled over Hades and are the first over chaos. Then Sackloss said to the angels, let's create a human being after the likeness and the image. And they fashioned Adam and his wife Eve, who in the cloud is called life because his name, all generations seek him. And each of them calls her by their names. Now Sackloss didn't missing some words, give birth, except missing some words among the generations missing some words, which this, missing some words. And the angel said to him, your life will last for a limited time with your children. Then Judas said to Jesus, how long can a person live? Jesus said, why are you amazed that lifespan of Adam and his generations are limited in a place where he received his kingdom with his ruler? Judas said to Jesus, does this human spirit die? Jesus said, this is how it is. God commanded Michael to loan spirits to people so that they might serve. So again, this is the anointing of consciousness into these beings that were created for negative reasons. Then the great one commanded Gabriel to give the spirits to the great generation with no king, the spirit along with the soul. So the rest of the souls, missing some words, light, missing some words, chaos, Missing some words, seek the spirit within you, which you've made to live in the flesh from the angelic generations. Then God calls knowledge to be brought to Adam and those with him, so the kings of chaos and Hades might rule over them. Then Judas said to Jesus, so what will those generations do? Jesus said, truly I say to you, the stars complete all these things. When Saklas completes the time span that's been determined for him, their first star will appear with the generations and they will finish what's been said. Then they'll sleep around in my name, murder their children, and they'll missing some, some words, evil and missing some words, the realms bringing the generation and presenting them to Saklas. And after that, missing some words, will bring the 12 tribes of Israel from missing some words. The generations will all serve Sakhlos, signing in my name, and your star will rule over the 13th realm. And then Jesus laughed. Judah said, Master, why are you laughing at me? Jesus answered and said, I'm not laughing at you, but the heir of the stars, because these six stars go astray with these five warriors, and they'll all be destroyed along with their creation. Then Jesus... Then Judas said to Jesus, what will those who've been baptized in your name? So now we're moving into the section called the betrayal. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, this baptism, which they've received in my name, will destroy the whole generation of earthly atoms. Tomorrow they'll torture the one who bears me. Truly, I say to you, no hand of a mortal human will fall upon me. Truly, I say to you, Judas, those who offer sacrifices to Ksaklos, and the missing some words, everything that's evil. 
but you'll do more than all of them because you'll sacrifice the human who bears me. Your horn has already been raised, your anger has been kindled, your star has ascended, and your heart has strayed. Truly, I say to you, your last missing some words, the missing some words of the realm have been defeated. The kings have grown weak, the angelic generation have grieved, and the evil they showed is destroyed, and the ruler is wiped out. And then the fruit of the great generation of Adam will be exalted. Because before heaven, earth, and the angels, that generation from the realms exist. Look, you've been told everything. Lift up your eyes and see the cloud with light in it and the stars around it. And the star that leads the way is your star. And Jesus looked up and saw the luminous cloud and he entered it. Those standing on the ground heard a voice from the cloud saying, The great generation missing some words and Judas didn't see Jesus anymore. So we saw Jesus walking into the light, basically, and Jesus was like, you're screwed, dude. Like, the guy you served, you're going to lose. Y'all are going to lose because the spirits that were put into these bodies, these mortal bodies you created that have a lifespan, those spirits, are, are they belong to God. And I came here to show, to show people that. So you're screwed, man. And then he pieces out and leaves. So we go on the last part of the Gospel of Judas. Immediately there was a disturbance among the Jews and more than missing some words. Their high priest grumbles because they had gone into the guest room to pray. But some scribes were there watching closely so they could arrest him during his prayer because they were afraid of the people since they all regarded him a prophet. And they approached Judas and said to him, What are you doing? Aren't you Jesus' disciple? And he answered them as they wish. Then Jesus received some money and handed him over to them. And that's all. That's the gospel of Judas. So sadly, I wish there was more of the gospel left for us to read. Again, for me, this is, I really find this philosophy, I, I love studying philosophy anyway, and so I'm super excited to dive deeper into the Sethian theology and seeing what there is to know about the more complexity of um, the battle of darkness and light of God and, and Satan and how this all happened. We know that Satan and Lucifer are two different entities. A lot of people kind of confuse them for the same thing, but they're not, they're two different entities. And so this gospel is starting to show us that there are so many more entities involved in this battle than we've been taught about. And I personally believe that's on purpose. We've uh, been kept ignorant to these things. And so I am excited about diving a little bit deeper Again, this doesn't mean that you have to believe this. You can think that this gospel is heretical if you want. That's totally fine. For me, this is just extremely interesting, and I'm excited to learn, and I'm really glad that you are all here on this journey with us. Again, please make sure to check us out on Tuesday nights on the Dark Outpost where we do a much deeper dive into these, um, these manuscripts, these missing gospels. As always, there is a link down in the description box below to David's platform that you can get on. Thank you so much to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the opening song, there's also a link down in the description box. And thank you to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you guys without him. I would not have a channel. So I am super appreciative of all he does to help with this channel. And I will talk to you all soon. Bye.